So I'd love to just welcome everyone to this week's Citizens Climate University. It's a weekly webinar program of Citizens Climate Lobbies that provides CCL supporters like you and I with access to in-depth training opportunities on topics related to climate change and effective climate advocacy. I'm your host, Brett Sees, and tonight's topic is going to be focused on carbon pricing and the oil, gas, and chemical industries. We're going to specifically join Bill Bray for a training on the impact of policies like the Energy Innovation Act on domestic oil, gas, and petrochemical industries. Bill's going to highlight how carbon pricing policy has the potential to drive massive investment and new job opportunities, as well as provide a manageable transition with opportunities that other industries can also follow. This training is also briefly going to discuss the support that the oil industry has expressed on pricing carbon in the past and how to leverage that as supporters and partners for carbon pricing in your own outreach and endorsement work. And especially at the end, we'll review a couple of ideas on how to even take this information at night and apply it to your local or state-based team for your own ongoing work. With all that being said, though, let me introduce our speaker for tonight and then let Bill take it from here. So we are going to hear from Bill Bray tonight. Bill is a retired engineer and executive with decades of experience in the oil and gas industry as a naval architect and engineer that designed ships. Bill is the group leader for CCL's the Woodlands Texas chapter. He is the team lead for CCL's Presbyterian Action Team, as well as a former leader of Team Oil, one of CCL's action teams that liaises with critical industries to educate CCL volunteers on oil and gas industry workings. And I'll pass it to you here, Bill, to take it from here. Okay, thank you, Brett, and thank you all for joining tonight or down the road with the, a recording. So our three learning goals are, one, that past oil price volatility has driven employment swings in the past, and it will also do so in the future, and that will be much more important for hiring and layoffs than a slowly rising carbon price. With a carbon price, U.S. crudes are going to have a couple of advantages on the global marketplace. One of those is that they have relatively low carbon content uh, of production. And the other is that there's a lot of U.S. crudes that are relatively short-term production. And a durable carbon price will drive huge investment and new job opportunities in what I've grouped into three areas, fuel conservation, carbon capture, utilization and storage, and alternative fuels, blue, green, hydrogen, ammonia, and biofuels. For our agenda, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more, give you a uh, perspective on where I'm coming from. I'm going to talk about the oil and gas industry, both their support for uh, carbon pricing and a little bit of overview of the industry. And then we're gonna look at the industry history through uh, carbon, through the oil price and talk about the, how that's impacted employment and how our carbon price is gonna impact demand. And all through, we're gonna be talking about opportunities for the, the industry. And at the end, we're going to talk about how CCLers can use this material in your advocacy, and we should have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So uh, as Brett said, I'm an a engineer that worked for Exxon for my career. Um, I have an MS in engineering and an MBA that I got at night. After that, we moved to Europe and were there for uh, most of a decade. And while we were there, we saw firsthand how the higher uh, gasoline prices because of the high petrol taxes made us so, uh, so much more efficient with our driving. And I wrote my first letter to the first President Bush, which was also during the first Gulf War, which was partially about oil, asking for higher energy prices in the U.S. Uh, my colleagues at Exxon, when I talked about this, thought that I was a little bit off the reservation. Um, but after uh, some time, I, Exxon has come around to supporting a, a revenue neutral carbon tax that started in 2009. And I uh, heard my first uh, talk about climate change within Exxon, I think it was 1996, when a senior atmospheric 
uh, scientists talked to a couple hundred pretty skeptical engineers and scientists uh, within Exxon about climate change and carbon dioxide and, and where it was coming from with our uh, emissions and, and what it was doing to the environment. So uh, I've been a fan of higher prices and uh, carbon pricing. And when I retired, I wanted to advocate more for carbon pricing and found CCL and CCE, and it was a perfect fit for me. The oil and gas industry has supported carbon pricing and it's uh, by far the strongest among the majors. And they've had support, and here are some uh, supporting statements from the largest US companies uh, for several years. And that it, it started with the majors and it's been much less strong with smaller and um, medium sized and independent, but the support is growing. And API, which represents the whole uh, American petroleum industry, uh, has recently come out in support of carbon pricing. So there is growing uh, support within the industry for, for carbon pricing. And in 2017, Team Oil led a CCU on understanding the uh, oil and gas support for carbon pricing. And that um, CCU is still available and it's um, still, still relevant. So to understand the oil and gas industry a bit more, we're gonna look at the various sectors. And when I started working, I think the energy industry represented about 10% of the US economy. So it was huge. It's much uh, smaller than that now. But the oil industry um, is broken up into a bunch of uh, significant um, sectors sort of along the way the oil flows. So it goes, starts in the upstream with exploration and development, first finding the oil and then figuring out how to develop it economically. And once you have a plan, then it goes into the production, building the equipment, installing it, uh, sometimes offshore, sometimes requiring a lot of infrastructure in remote areas and pipelines and drilling the well. And then it goes into the operations phase, which lasts for decades usually. And all of that is either onshore or offshore. And if it's offshore, it adds a, a lot of complications and it requires a lot of special skills. So when you talk about the industry, there's sort of two industries, there's the onshore and the, and the offshore. And then the oil flows into the downstream uh, via transportation. And at this stage, crude is transported mainly by uh, ships and pipelines to refineries. And there are tens of thousands of production facilities around the US and 120 some refineries. So it's a, a big consolidation and centralization. And the refineries that are remaining, when I started, there were 400 and some um, and they're, they're huge uh, installations. And they uh, break down the crude just by distillation into the various components, but more and more, they're also breaking the hydrocarbon molecules down and reforming it into higher value products, which means more useful to society. And, and that's important as we talk about the energy transition and the ability to, to manage molecules. And then the, the output of the refineries basically fuels and feedstocks, and those go into the distribution and, and marketing system. And the distribution, again, includes transportation, uh, still ships and pipelines, but also barges and rail tankers and tank trucks on the road and all the way to uh, consumers and, and end users, be they industrial or the, the corner gas station. On the natural gas side, the upstream is virtually identical to the oil upstream because a lot of natural gas is produced in oil wells. And so that, that's the, the same. 
and the uh, distribution and marketing or downstream is very different than, than oil because oil is um, easily shipped around the world. It's very cheap to ship it. So oil is very much a global commodity, but natural gas is transported uh, by pipelines mainly. And so that's much more of a regional product. And there is LNG, liquefied natural gas shipping that can move uh, natural gas after cooling it and um, very expensive energy intensive process. Uh, so it's, and, and those are very long-term projects. So it's, it's difficult to transport it between continents. It can be done, but there's still very much regional markets in, in the different areas in the US and Europe and different markets spread around Asia. And um, the distribution within those pipeline systems are the, the producers are usually um, produced into the, the pipeline system and then marketing to the end users is usually by other uh, utility companies. And the chemical and petrochemical industries are um, distinct from the oil and gas industry, but they're very closely allied because they have many of the same uh, skills and types of workers and often the plants are adjacent to each other and heavily integrated. So there is a lot of overlap and when we're talking about the, the future and opportunities for the oil and gas industry, it's important to include the uh, chemical industry. But let's now look at the oil and industry through the lens of uh, past oil prices. And this is a chart showing the uh, first purchase price average for a year, going back to when oil was first introduced and produced in the country. To begin with, it was competing with whale oil, so it was pretty expensive. But then industry figured out how to produce it efficiently and transport it. And that ushered in a century of cheap oil and that helped power the industrial revolution. And then if we move on, we see that there was more price volatility as we got into the 70s and, and onwards. And so those price shocks had a huge impact on the, on the industry and the economy. And if we look just at the, the most recent 50 years, I started working in 1981, so about the, the peak of this first uh, price shock. And one of the things that happened, the, the industry had been used to long uh, history of very stable and low prices. So when the prices increased dramatically, there was a lot of trying to adjust and figure out how to consume less energy because the, the oil and gas industry is both uh, capital intensive and energy intensive. It uses a lot of energy to produce energy. And so there was a big push on how to conserve energy and, and use less of it in our production. And we looked at all sorts of um, energy conservation ideas and projects and implemented the ones that were economic and the ones that weren't economic at the, the 30 or $35 a barrel prices were put on the shelf. And um, when the price went up again in the early in this century, some of those were taken off the shelf and, and reapplied and other ideas were looked at. And there are lots of projects who are sitting on the shelves waiting for the uh, price to go up enough to justify these different methods of, of saving uh, fuel, whether waste heat recovery or, or uh, additional um, equipment and, and uh, steps in the operations. So this is the average price for uh, a year. And we could show the average price for a month, uh, a week, a day, and that would show lots more volatility. The, the finer a time we have. And if, if we went down to the 
every day, we'd see that the price went negative here during uh, the early stages of COVID in 2020. So th this shows uh, uh, some volatility, but there's lots more volatility underlying uh, the oil prices on this annual average. But I'm using annual average because in terms of employment, um, it I think is more representative. But if we now go to the next slide with um, employment, this shows the workers in the US oil and gas extraction jobs. So this is basically the upstream uh, developing and producing. It's not the whole industry, but it's the most volatile and the most impacted by prices. So the, um, during the first price shock, there was a huge increase in employment, almost doubling of number of employees. And that was to produce more oil because the, the world was short of oil, which led to the, the price increases. But when you, um, when the price dropped, then there was a huge oversupply of workers and within two years, 19% of the total workers were laid off. And so that was a huge uh, dislocation, especially for people like me who just started working and also people who had the expectation that they were gonna work for the industry their whole career. And since it'd been very stable coming up to this point, there was, there was a lot of that. And then there's a long couple of decades of uh, employment declines. And that a lot of that was due to the structural change of increased automation. And during this uh, declining in employment, production wasn't declining like that. We were just figuring out how to produce more oil with more automation and fewer people. But this was a structural change and this um, reduction in manpower didn't happen because of layoffs. It happened because of attrition, people retiring and leaving the industry for other reasons and very limited hiring. So the, the industry, there was hiring and firing over this period as one company did well and expanded and other companies didn't and, and folded. But there wasn't large layoffs, even with this large reduction in the need for workers. Then the price went up again, and um, there was more of a lag in hiring this time, but there was still a, an increase. But again, when the price dropped, uh, 26, over half, or over a quarter of the workforce was laid off. And so we're talking about 200,000 workers in the, the upstream side of the business. And today we've got uh, almost 400,000 uh, renewable workers. So you have to be careful when you're talking to oil and gas folks about renewable jobs, because many don't think they're um, as equivalent. But uh, we have a friend in uh, the Woodlands in, in Houston just installed, installed solar panels, and he got lots of bids for before he did the job. And he said, all of the people who talked to him and gave him bids were young guys out of the oil and gas industry. So there is a lot of transference there. But if we move on and look at our Energy Innovation Act and the ramp that we're trying to get of $10 per barrel per ton of CO2 emitted per year, that works out to $4.3 per barrel every year that the price, the average price of oil needs to increase to cover the fee. And we, we know that this isn't gonna be the, the future price, but, but this is the underlying driver that the carbon fee is gonna put on to our economy, to both the energy industry, to consumers, to the whole economy. That's, that's why we want an economy-wide carbon price. I can't, well, nobody can predict the future price, but what I've done on this next slide is to take the volatility in terms of percent change every year over the last three decades of the last century and apply it to the, to the future now. And that's the, the result that you get. 
So we don't know what future price is going to be, but we know there's going to be volatility and swings. And I think there's going to be more volatility than we've had in the past because we're going into an energy transition. So it's even more complicated than, than what we've had in the past with just trying to, to balance supply and demand. But future hiring and firing is going to be driven by the peaks for hiring because we price goes up and we don't have enough oil. So we need to produce more to balance um, demand. And then as we produce more, there's going to be drops. Uh, so I, I think future hiring and, and layoffs are going to be driven by these, uh, whatever the volatility we have down the road, not the underlying ramp of a, of a carbon fee. But let's look a little bit more at that underlying ramp. So most of you are familiar with En-ROADS and I've used that to look at oil demand. And we plug in the, on the lower right, the, um, our carbon fee and dividend ramp. That reduces the um, temperature at the end of the uh, century by a full degrees cent centigrade. So that's not everything we need to do, but that's the, the biggest single thing we can do. And if we go to the next slide, we look at the world oil demand because En-ROADS is a, a global model. And it shows that the oil demand is going to continue going up for about a decade. And that's not due to the developed world, it's due to the developing world. And then it goes into a long uh, decline. And it, down at the end of the century, it's about half of what um, it is today. And I don't, there are other things going on in the economy, but so I, I think this may be uh, a greater decline, but in terms about of the impact of our carbon pricing proposal, I think this is a fair representation. And, and even if it goes down faster, it shows, and I think almost all the projections show that oil is gonna be around um, for a long time. We're gonna need it for the energy transition. And when we look at this 70 years from the, from the peak onward, that's a couple of careers at least. And so this is a long, slow change. It's not, and, and turning off the industry um, overnight. And in terms of jobs, that's, that's critical. And let's move on to the kind of crude oil that the US has. And we have an advantage in that we have low carbon intensity oil production in the US. This is a chart out of Thunder Said and work they did for the Climate Leadership Council. And it shows the amount of energy uh, used, amount of um, carbon emissions used to produce the oil, not to, to burn it, but to produce it. And the global average is about five, uh, 58 kilograms per barrel of CO2 emissions to produce each barrel of oil. And the Permian is about, ideal Permian, which is where we're headed towards, is about 40. And Gulf of Mexico is 35 kilograms per barrel. So uh, a little over half of what the global average is. So that's going to be a economic benefit for us. And we've calculated the numbers in, uh, in red there. We, yeah, in red that the global average uh, with our carbon fee after 10 years is gonna pay about $7, just shy of $7 additional per barrel of oil. Our Gulf of Mexico crude is gonna have $4 per barrel additional. So that's um, $2.70 advantage for Gulf of Mexico over the uh, world average. But the world average is all over the place. And if you look at the major North American crudes, they're uh, much higher. And here, the oil sands is up at, at 20. So five times what our um, additional 
carbon price uh, impact is. So U.S. oil production is going to have this advantage. And another advantage that the U.S. oil production has is we have a lot of shale oil. And shale oil comes from, is produced from source rock. So that's where the oil is formed over the million years with organic material. And traditionally, oil is produced from reservoirs. So it's formed in source rocks, but then there are fissures and um, fractures and porosity, and the oil and gas migrate up to cap rocks where it's caught in cap rocks and forms a pool. And traditional um, oil and gas production is out of these pools or reservoirs. But those reservoirs are bigger projects and they need to produce, and they do produce for longer term and they need to produce for, for decades to be economic. Whereas the, the shale oil only produces for a few years and then they move on and drill more wells. So we currently have a very high oil price, market oil price. And that is, and that is partially due to the terrible war in Ukraine but oil was also over $80 a barrel even before the war. And that was driven by imbalance of supply and demand. And part of that was due to reduced production in the West because we wanted to reduce the production of oil to address climate change. But um, that is, we can't just reduce production without reducing consumption. We're all working at carbon pricing that reduces consumption. We, we agree that we need to do that. And that's the, the efficient way to change, but we don't have that in place yet. We're not reducing consumption. So we can't just reduce uh, production. And when we have this imbalance and the high market price, we have significant geopolitical consequences. We're seeing that we're funding Putin and petro states we're uh, putting a break on economic growth. We're um, moving backwards on gasoline taxes. We're sort of moving in the wrong direction there. And it's not possible to put in carbon pricing with this uh, politically possible with the, the high market prices. And we don't have a dividend to protect the consumer. And we're not getting the environmental benefit because it's not durable. Industry investors and consumers know that this is a market price and they don't know where it's going, but they, they know the price will change. But they're not making the big steps and big investments that they would if they knew we had a, a durable, uh, bipartisan, uh, slowly increasing price on carbon. So the world still needs oil for the energy transition. And the current high prices are going to drive more uh, drilling to produce more oil. And from an environmental standpoint, it's better for the world to use short-term shale oil rather than invest in deep water uh, remote mega projects that are going to want to produce for, for decades. So if the US can produce additional oil, that's, I think, in the big picture, an environmental benefit. And it would also benefit the US oil and gas industry. We move on to natural gas. Previously, oil, we were talking about global. Now we need to talk about US demand, because as we said earlier, natural gas is much more of a regional product. So, Thunder said, uh, as part of their study for uh, the Climate Leadership Council uh, analyzed the uh, expected increase in natural gas demand or the demand for uh, natural gas with the, the carbon dividend proposal starting out at $43 and then increasing at 5% over inflation. And they concluded that natural gas demand was going to increase in a couple of years by 15% and then start a long decline. And this is because natural gas is replacing coal for power generation. We have excess power generation, gas-fired power generation capacity. So very quickly when there's a carbon price 
it impacts coal more than twice as much as it impacts natural gas per kilowatt. So natural gas is going to displace coal fairly quickly, and there's going to be this bump in natural gas demand. As far as uh, other opportunities for the oil and gas industry, there's energy conservation, which we've talked about a little bit, but that is going to uh, apply to the oil and gas industry, but it's also going to apply to all industries that use fossil fuel energy because as the price goes up, they're going to need to, uh, it's going to be economic to do more, to conserve more. Uh, carbon capture and storage is a huge opportunity. And that is where we take carbon dioxide out of um, emission stream, it be smokestacks or chemical processes. At the moment, we're, we generate CO2 by chemical processes to make fertilizer, for example. And we have basically pure CO2, but we vent it into the air because it's not economic. When we have a price on carbon that can be captured and stored underground long-term safe storage. When we do carbon capture out of uh, emission stream, most of the cost is in carbon capture. And that's a huge opportunity for the chemical industry, transporting and developing the markets for the CO2 is an opportunity for the gas industry. And so this is gonna create lots of jobs and investments with our uh, ramp on carbon price, we get up to around 80 or $100 a ton, which is where most of these carbon capture and storage projects become economic in eight to 10 years. And a lot of these projects are gonna take that long to plan, permit, and, and construct. So it's gonna start investment. As soon as we get a durable, um, price on carbon is going to start the, that increases to that level in the near term, we're going to start getting huge investment. And CCL's Team Oil did a great report. And Larry Kramer, one of the code leads for Team Oil is um, the one of the leaders of that. And he's a great resource if you're interested in carbon capture and storage. And alternative fuels is another huge area. Uh, biofuels, we see a fair amount about, but blue and green hydrogen and ammonia is, uh, it hasn't really started in a big way, but it is coming when we price carbon. And that's especially important for heavy industries that are difficult to decarbonize and that includes uh, a lot of heavy industry, but also long haul air transport where hydrogen is a front runner and deep sea long haul shipping where ammonia is uh, an opportunity to power engines similar to the, to the oil fired engines that we, we use now. And hydrogen and ammonia aren't really fuel sources. They require energy to make them from other sources. And today we make most of our hydrogen and ammonia from fossil fuels and vent the carbon uh, dioxide into the air. And so it's called gray uh, fuels, gray ammonia or hydrogen. If we capture the carbon dioxide, then it's called blue. And there's a big range of blue hydrogen and ammonia. It can be uh, made from dirty natural gas that has a lot of, of emissions in the production, and we can only capture a little bit of CO2, or with a durable price on carbon like we're going to have if when, when we get our Energy Innovation Act enacted, it's going to say that in a few years, the price on carbon is going to be higher and it's going to continue going up. So it's going to be economic to capture virtually all the carbon dioxide. So if we get our proposal in, I think this blue hydrogen and ammonia is going to be very green. And eventually we'll move to green where it's made totally from renewable energy and there's zero carbon emissions. But for the transition, we need these blue hydrogen and ammonia one, because we don't have enough renewable energy. 
And two, we need to get on with decarbonizing these heavy industrial users that are, are gonna be difficult to decarbonize. But if we use blue hydrogen and ammonia, we can start the process of changing the plants, changing the airlines, changing the, the ships to run off these different fuel types. So Thunder said, analyze the total impact of carbon dividend on the US economy. And they concluded that in terms of jobs, over just a couple of years, we're gonna create 200,000 new incremental jobs. And that's uh, initial bump. And then there's a long-term trend that it's gonna continue on. The, the blue stack on top is carbon capture and storage. And that shows that coming in more significantly down the road, but that, that strong growth is gonna continue on. And remember, this is 200,000 new jobs in just a couple of years. The total US oil and gas production upstream employment is on the order of 200,000. And this isn't all in the oil patch, but a lot of it is. The next slide shows the companion uh, incremental investments. And after a couple of years, it's 100 billion in, in incremental investment. So huge opportunities for not just the oil and gas, but for, for industry and, and the economy. If we look at the individual sectors that we uh, talked about earlier and, and how the industry is organized, we can look at the different job skills in those areas and how some of these opportunities are gonna impact them. And for the oil first, we gotta remember that this is a long gradual transition uh, downward in production, but a lot of these opportunities are gonna happen uh, much sooner. They're gonna be very near-term uh, opportunities in the next decade versus um, many decades for the for the um, oil decline. But on the exploration and production side, carbon capture and storage and geothermal are big um, job creators and opportunities for these companies. Uh, in the operations phase, a lot of those skills are transferable and CCS and um, energy efficiency jobs are gonna be a factor. On the offshore side, a lot of the jobs are transferable and are already transferring and, and even equipment is transferable for the offshore wind and that's already happening. Uh, there's also a lot of work, uh, more research stage and prototype stage on tidal and current and that's gonna be coming on. But again, requiring these kind of offshore skills. Across the whole downstream, energy efficiency is gonna be a big player. And on shipping, uh, the jobs are pretty transferable. On pipelines, uh, a lot of the jobs are transferable, but there's gonna be uh, CCS work. On the refining side, uh, a lot of transferable jobs, especially to the petrochemical industry, which is gonna need a lot of jobs, need a lot of employees. And the bioliquids and the hydrogen, blue hydrogen and, and blue ammonia. And a lot of the distribution and marketing jobs are, are pretty transferable. Marketing widgets or, um, or gasoline or, or lubricating oil. On the natural gas side, the uh, initial bump in uh, gas production and then a gen general gradual transi transition down and uh, upstream is the same as oil and the distribution and marketing is again, largely transferable plus biogas and, and CCS work. The petrochemical industry has been growing for, for decades fast. That's gonna continue on. And the additional carbon capture and storage work and energy efficiency work is gonna drive a whole lot of additional employment that can come a lot of that from the oil and gas industry. So I've got a few headlines here and they're not really important from the headlines themselves, but they're examples that you might be able to find in your area or region. So on the top left is Talos Energy. They're a small E&P uh, producer, 
uh, oil and gas producer from the Gulf of Mexico. And they said they got all the skills to uh, sequester carbon. So they're marketing their skills for sequestering carbon. World Energy, uh, a few years ago, invested $350 million to fully convert their Paramount refinery to renewables in California. Occidental Petroleum is investing between $800 million and a billion on direct air capture facilities. And their plan is to use the carbon, the CO2 credits that they capture and sequester to sell zero emission oil. ExxonMobil is working at a uh, hundred billion dollar carbon and capture storage zone along the Houston ship channel. So again, just examples, but you may be able to find headlines in your area. So if you revisit the three learning goals, uh, past oil price volatility has driven employment and it will continue to do so and our um, increasing uh, price on uh, carbon for the carbon fee will not create huge um, layoffs. With the carbon price, U.S. crudes are going to see a significant advantage both on lower carbon intensity and the shorter term production benefit of the shale oil and gas. And we're going to have huge new investment in fuel conservation, carbon capture and storage and utilization and uh, alternative fuels, blue, green, hydrogen, ammonia, and, and hydrogen. So how can we use this as CCLers in our advocacy? Well, to start with, I wanted to show you how we're using it on the third coast and what our strategy is there. And we have the highest concentration of oil gas in the country in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And our approach is to embrace the transition and embrace the opportunities. We talk about the natural gas demand bump. Shannon Carraway, an executive in the electrical uh, production industry, has a Texas Energy Renaissance uh, pitch. And there's a link to that, uh, the pitch that he gave to Republic EN uh, that's in, in a link there. The US carbon advantage that one piece of that was the crude oil carbon advantage that we talked about, but this they have it for the whole industry, for, for the whole US economy where we're very carbon efficient. Uh, carbon capture and storage, the, the team oil paper, and the, the other job areas that we've been, been talking about. But our approach is to uh, look for the opportunities and promote the opportunities and not, not worker supports. So every state district and chapter needs to develop their own strategy. But as um, Charles Gabras, who's on the call here and one of the team oil uh, co-leads likes to point out is if we can sell the fact that this is a manageable transition for the oil and gas industry to the rest of America, and people who are concerned about the economic impact of the energy transition and how we're gonna be able to manage that, if they can see that it's manageable for the oil and gas industry, it should be much easier for everybody else. But look at the industries in your area or region, and uh, if they're oil and gas and chemical industries, this is fairly transportable. If you don't have those industries, but you have um, equipment and material suppliers, those impact uh, the whole, um, th those kind of materials are used for the oil and gas, but for the whole uh, economy that are gonna be doing uh, some of these energy uh, conservation projects and uh, CCS. If you have large industrial emitters, those are opportunities for carbon capture and storage and uh, big investments in energy conservation. So they, they may have been considered at risk if they're emitters, but it, it may be, but they're big investment opportunities. And as always in CCL, consider all the potential audiences that, that might be concerned about the economic impact and see how you can reach out to them and, and use this or a portion of this um, 
approach with them. And please utilize Team Oil to help um, provide the, the expertise on, um, on the oil and gas industry and these opportunities. It has members around the country, so you may be able to find local members that, that could help you there. And before we get into q and I wanted to share a picture of a gas station on a corner. And when I grew up, there were intersections that had four gas stations, one on each corner. And we don't see that anymore. My son likes to talk about an intersection in Houston that has four Starbucks. We won't see that um, uh, for very long either, but the economy is always changing. Uh, the oil and gas industry is, has always been changing and it's gonna continue changing. And this is another change. It's a big change and there'll be a lot of impacts but there's also a lot of opportunity and uh, the folks that embrace the opportunity and uh, get on with making this transition are going to, uh, in general, thrive. And that's such a powerful metaphor to close us on, Bill. I think that all of us on the line here tonight deeply appreciate the framing, the details, the background, the perspective that you provided. And if you have any other questions, please do feel free to continue to follow up to Bill or I. I've also put a link where you can access Team Oil. I can't underscore enough uh, the important work that they're doing as a team. Um, so just a huge round of applause to all of our team oil leaders and uh, members on the line tonight. Um, please do reach out and access them if you have any other ongoing questions or would like to follow up. The team oil does meet on Wednesdays uh, in the evenings every other or quite twice a month and uh, join one of the calls and you can hear more about it and, and ask your questions and and have more discussion along this topic and lots of other good presenters and, and similar topics. And thank you all for your great work with uh, CCL. Well, thank you, Bill. I'm gonna unmute all lines just so that we can all appreciate your good work here. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Stay safe and we look forward to hearing how you use this information in your own local outreach. Take care, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.